Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Understanding and Managing Challenging Samples in Your Laboratory. I'm Eva Maria Zoman, Product Manager for Northern Europe at Orthoclinical Diagnostics, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational webinar is brought to you by LabRoots and sponsored by Orthoclinical Diagnostics. Assay interferences are a common problem in the laboratory, creating a disconnect between the test results and the clinical reality. Interferences force the lab to investigate, to handle samples as exception, which interrupts the workflow and creates a delay in the test results. In today's webinar, our speakers will address and discuss the effect of common endogenous interferences on different clinical chemistry analytes. I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click on the Send button. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, you can report your problem by clicking on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. For a complete biography on all our presenters today, please visit the Biography tab at the top of your screen. I'd like to now introduce our first presenters, Dr. Rachel Merrington and Finlay McKenzie from Birmingham Quality UK NIQAS. Rachel and Finlay will present the results of a recent study, which looks at the effect of hemolysis, ictorus, and lipemia on the measurement of several common biochemistry analytes across different platforms. Rachel and Finlay, you may now begin your presentations. Thank you very much, Eva, and thank you very much to Ortho for inviting us to present our work this afternoon with you. Now, my name is Rachel Marrington. I'm the Deputy Director at Birmingham Quality, which is part of University Hospital Birmingham NHS Foundation Trust and part of UK NECRAS. Now, there's a list of um, the declarations that Finney and I have affiliated with on the screen. I'm not going to go through them now. What we would like to talk to you about today is really to get you to think more about your specimens, what they look like, and the composition of them, and how these could affect clinical results that you are reporting. Now, a little bit of background. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but when we're talking about serum indices, we're talking about hemolyzed specimens. Now, when a specimen is hemolyzed, this is the red color that you see, and this is the hemoglobin. Um, from within the cells that has leached out into the serum or the plasma. And this might be because the cells, have, um, the serum has been on the cells for a prolonged period of time, or there may have been the problem during collection. Um, the tourniquet may have been too tight, the wrong gauge needles used. But either way, the contents of the cells, as well as including the hemoglobin, have leaked out and made the serum or plasma red. And it is the heme, that, the iron in the heme, that is giving this red colour. Now, icterus is when the specimens look a yellow or a green tinge to them. And this is because of a, an elevated bilirubin within the specimen. Now, you most frequently see this in liver disease. Um, but the important thing to note here is not just the colour yellow that can be affecting any spectrophotometric assays, it's also the bilirubin can interfere with assays that use hydrogen peroxidase and can actually cause a false decrease in results. So you could um, be misreporting in some assays that use hydrogen peroxidase and if you have an elevated icterus index. Now the final one um, indices that we look at is lipemia or turbulimetry. Now when you have an increased concentration of lipoprotein particles, you get light scattering in um, spectrophotometric assays. And also, this does cause some problems with indirect ISEs because of the space that is occupied with the lipoproteins that are used. Now, as we'll come on to in a little bit more detail later on how we make the specimens, we use intralipid in our lipemia specimens, and that's a very concentrated emulsion that it isn't a true reflection of lipoprotein particles, but it does it helps in terms of the color, but it doesn't help in terms of the space occupying what you would have with like lipids. Now just for reference, I'm showing you what the absorbent spectrum look like for hemolysis, for icterus, and for lipemia. 
And it's just this is just really so that you can have an idea of the wavelengths that are used and any spectrophotometric assay would be affected if it is um, looking at the wavelengths which um, the, there are absorbance maxima for the hemolysis or the bilirubin or the lipemia. Now, really, really, before we start, we sort of think how much of a problem actually is this? Now, what I have here is some workload from one of our local hospitals that has about 50% um, general practice workload and it's 50% hospital workload. And it really is, I was just looking at what over a week, what percentage of samples they had a hemolysis, icterus and lipemia above, so two grams per litre for hemolysis, and, and icterus was 100 micromoles per litre and lipemia one millimole per litre. So this a low levels of serum indices and it's affecting a low level of work. But depending on your workload, this could actually impact quite a lot of patients having to be rebled or being mismanaged. So our UK NECAS for clinical chemistry scheme is served to approximately 500 or 550 participants. And last year we conducted an audit to actually look to see how many of those participants measure serum indices and whether they measure them only on their chemistry platform or also on their immunoassay platforms. As you see, 97% of our participants do measure serum indices, and 85% of those do measure indices on both their chemistry and immunoassay platforms. Now, what was interesting was 33% of participants apply the same serum indices to other assays using the same sample um, elsewhere in the laboratory. Now, this is really important because what we'll be coming on to in a few minutes is looking at the applicability of uh, indices that have been measured on one platform to other manufacturers' platforms. Now, interestingly, only 13% of participants back in 2019 measured any form of internal quality control on their serum indices. Now, I am the scheme organiser of the UK NEQAS for Serum Indices EQA scheme. This is a scheme that is ISO 17043 accredited and it has been operating since 2017. Now, all of our material is made in-house. It is not commercially sourced. Now, we either distribute material in its native form, so with endogenous hemolysis, um, icterus, and lipemia, or we add in hemolysate, bilirubin, or intralipid. And that is the case for the specimens that we have made for Project Quibble, which Finley will be discussing later. Now, we distribute three specimens monthly for analysis of hemolysis, icterus, and lipemia. And we also have something called Analyte X. Now, this is a different analyte every month, and we ask participants to measure this to look at the impact of hemolysis, icterus, and lipemia on the, that, the, the concentration of that analyte. Now, our scheme can handle indices and categories. We'll only be looking at the indices today, as that is the um, form that also results are produced in. But, and our target value that we use is the manufacturer mean. I've just included for reference here the scheme units that we use. We know that many different participants report, so now we'll analyze and report in different scheme units to this, but that this is what the data will be shown in. Now, if we first look at the hemolysis index, this is one of our classic um, scheme report, report designs for our schemes. We have three specimens that have been distributed and it's a recent distribution. And on this occasion, all the specimens had some degree of hemolysis, the specimen B has some bilirubin added and specimen C has some intralipid added as well. You can see from the histogram how um, the different participants have performed. There's more detailed information um, in the table on the left. And you can see that this participant has done very well. They've got a green traffic light against all of their results. But what is probably more important is actually looking to see how hemolysis um, compares between the manufacturers, especially if you are going to be moving your um, samples between different platforms. And on this graph, it's all the data that we have collected over the last three years and looking at the hemolysis index for the different manufacturers 
and we're comparing it to the Roche um, hemolysis index. Now, I want to be very clear, we're not saying that Roche is the correct um, result, it's the target value, it is just it is the most populous method and we have to have something that we're comparing to. So in this case, I hope you'll agree, there is good agreement between all of the major manufacturers on the hemolysis indices that they are producing. Now, if we... If we move on to Ictiris, um, once again, it's a similar graph. I'm not showing you the report format on this. This is just looking at the data from the last three years. You will see, at first sight, you might say there's not good agreement between all the manufacturers. And I probably should point out that the pink dots here are those for Ortho, and they are giving lower results alongside Abbott compared to, say, Siemens and the Roche. Now, once again, we're not saying Roche is correct, Siemens are correct. We don't know who is correct. Everybody's individual, and this is because different wavelengths are used to calculate the Icturus indices. But what is interesting to note, if you look really closely, there are some diamonds um, on the identity line. And if you look for the pink diamonds, they overlay the same diamonds for the Siemens, for the Roche, for the Abbott. And this is where we've actually added in unconjugated bilirubin. Now, we predominantly use conjugated bilirubin because it is water soluble. And it means that we don't have to add any organic solvents into our specimens, which could cause other problems. But when we have added unconjugated bilirubin in, we do see very good agreement between the manufacturers. Now, the little insert on this slide shows that there is a two nanometer absorbance wavelength maximum difference for the conjugated and the unconjugated bilirubin. And this is a well-known um, phenomenon. It isn't just something with our specimens. Now, likewise, your patient specimens will be a mixture of conjugated and unconjugated bilirubins that will be contributing to the icterus. So you really do need to bear this in mind that perhaps the icterus index isn't quite as transferable between manufacturers. If we just come on to lipemia now, now uh, this lipemia is it's a little bit more different, difficult to think about. That we have lipoproteins present, or in our case, the majority is infolipid, and these do separate out, just like a patient sample would, our EQA samples separate out as well. Now we ask our participants to mix the specimens thoroughly um, before they analyze them, but we do see a lot of variation, which is what we're seeing here between the different manufacturers. Once again, we don't know who's right or who's wrong. It's just saying there is a lot of variation with lipemic specimens. And this certainly will hold true with your clinical specimens too, that once it's been separated, if they've been left to stand for a while, they will start to separate out. So if you go and then analyze them, the lipemic index that you originally measured will not reflect the adequate sample that you've taken for analysis if they have separated. Now, just finally, before we move on to Project Quibble, I want to quickly show you Analyte X. Now, using the same distribution that I showed earlier, this happens to be total protein. The picture on the right-hand side of the as a picture of the three specimens we actually sent out. I think you'll agree, they just look red. They all look the same degree of red. And from the naked, even from the eye, you, you can't actually tell there's any difference. Now, I haven't gone through the report, but there were differences that the um, icterus was detected and lipemia was detected. But if you just look at the histograms, it's the same axis of on the x-axis you just need to look at the spread of the data. You don't, there's no need to actually look at the individual methods on this. You can see all participants, there has been a change as the specimen has gone from just being hemolyzed to slightly icteric, and this is a very low level, which you would, could normally get, and to being slightly lipemic. You're getting a big difference in the total protein result. Now, I'm not going to make any further comments on that, but I'm just going to move on to my final slide now before handing over. And it's, we also ask participants whether they would 
report that result based on the indices that they have seen. Now, all I want you to gain from this is that there are three specimens that had three very different serum indices, but the different specimens look the same. There's a, there are pie charts, which the green is, would you report it? Yes. The red is, would you report it? No. They look the same. Every participant would have reported the specimens the same, really, um, whether they were going to report them, yes or no. But as I show you, if you remember from the previous slide, there was a big difference in the total proteins seen between the specimens. So I'm just going to leave you with that. And then um, Finley is going to go into more detail with Project Quibble for you in a minute. Thank you. Hello, I'm Finlay McKenzie. I want to quickly tell you about Project Quibble, which was the acronym we've got for quantifying indices in biochemistry laboratories. The objective of this little project was to investigate the impact of different concentrations of HIL indices on a number of clinical chemistry analytes across a lot or all across a, a range of major diagnostic manufacturers platforms at the same time. So it wasn't just ortho analyzers we were looking at, we were looking at the, all of the major players. Now, this study was taken in the last quarter of 2020, and it's key to note that this was not an EQA scheme, it was a one-off snapshot of where we were. Now what we did, we covered a range of clinical chemistry and cardiac analytes, and then at the same time we looked at some endocrinology and inflammation. But essentially we were talking about 39 different analytes and for each of those 39 analytes, we were looking at hemolysis, icterus, and lipemia. So we've got about 120 different graphs and tables I could show you. I'm not going to show you all today, but I'm going to touch on some, some key examples of the type of things we can, we can show, and the rest of the data will be available in due course. So what we sent out was uh, 11 different specimens, a base at the beginning and the end, three levels of hemolysis, three levels of icterus, and three levels of lipemia. And the samples were made in-house by ourselves. And as Rachel had said, the way we make these samples is not to try and get the, the color and the cell contents, but we don't have the, the space uh, considerations that you would see in a clinical specimen for, say, measuring a high lipid in an, a direct ISE. We don't cover that. It's really more the, the color and the content we're looking at. So to that end, I'm quickly going to show a few slides that are all in the same format. There's a red part hemolysis, yellow icterus, and the blue for lipemia. This was just looking at the impact of the different, the different manufacturers on the, uh, the increased values. The scales here are quite generous. So it looks here just to the, to the uninitiated. All of the, all of the major players do have an issue with the redness that you get with, with hemolysis. But I'll pass quickly on to the one that most people consider uh, to be the, the key analyte when looking at hemolysis in particular, because not only have you got the red color, you've got the leakage of the cell contents. So the potassium levels do rise. They rise because the intracellular potassium is released into the serum. And we can see here that all of the, the manufacturers get uh, impacted in, in one way or, or another. The key thing nowadays is looking at error budgets. And this is the, the way that lots of people now across the, the, the professions, international, the EQA providers, we're all looking at describing things in terms of a, a total error budget. And again, you can look at it in terms of uncertainty and measurement as well. So it's the same thing for coming at it from a different angle. But what we're looking at then for any test that you do, you want uh, you've got a component of the error budget to do with what, how biased your assay might be, what the imprecision of the assay might be, and other uncertainties that add together to form the total error. And the indices form part of this other uncertainty. So if we look at the impact of hemolysis on potassium, for example, there's a couple of sources you could look at to see what the, the experts are saying. So looking at total error, the EFLM database is looking at and total error of, of 4.8%, and that's based on biological variation, which is probably the best approach to do. 
the CLIA and the Birmingham Quality UK and ECWAS are both taking information back from proficiency testing or EQA schemes. And one of the, the papers is quoting the, the uh, CLIA as being plus or minus 0.3 millimoles per litre, and the Birmingham Quality is coming out as 3.2% uh, total error, which at a potassium of 6 equates to about 0.2 millimoles per litre. These are actually quite tight limits. But if we look at what actually happens in, in real samples. This is the first graph that I'm showing is from the ortho systems, and this is looking at the apparent rise of, or the real rise of potassium when the uh, hemolysis is uh, between two, three, four, five, and eight. And essentially what we're seeing is for a, a, a rise of one gram per liter of hemolysis equates to 0.3 millimoles per liter of potassium. And looking at this second graph here, this is taken from uh, an audit that we did of our participants looking to see what cutoffs they actually used. And again, the different colors are what the manufacturers recommend and also recommend a limit of 0.5. And in that case, that eats up about half of their error budget in, in, in hemolysis. But if you just look at the, the range of colors, some of the green people are at a very low level, but most of the greens are in the middle somewhere. Some of these red ones are at quite high levels. So the message from this is that different manufacturers recommend different levels, but on top of that, the laboratories themselves will choose whether or not to take the advice of the manufacturer. Quickly looking at creatinine, which is one of my favorite analytes. Uh, I've done a lot of work on this over the years. So there's a couple of things to look at. The first thing to look at in, with the hemolysis is that you can get an impact in either direction. You can get some methods, you get a, an increase in percentage bias, and in some methods you get a decrease in percentage bias. Some methods have, have no increase at all. And again, just for the record, I'll, I'll say luckily here we've got ortho, but behaving reasonably well here in, in the middle. But there are, are other things that go on. There's, uh, in the presence of bilirubin, you will get a decrease in apparent creatinine from some of the, the Jaffe methods. And again, the lipemia tends to be relatively flat, and some of this noise, as Rachel said, might be to do with specimen mixing at the end, but certainly at the low level, lipemia, there doesn't appear to be an impact. I suppose I'm concerned about creatinine because the, the values that you get from that do feed into AKI and GFR calculations. And even a very small difference in absolute numbers and absolute bias in creatinine does make a big impact on patient pathways. This is a, a, some graphs from tri the troponins. Now, I'm indebted to my colleague, Alan Reed in Glasgow, who, who helped us with, with this uh, service. But looking at this, the hemolysis, again, is, is probably the thing you would be worrying about most of all in real life situation, getting blood from someone who apparently has had a heart attack. So you have a situ situation here where most of the, the methods have, have a, a decrease in apparent troponin. In fact, the, the auto system is a slight increase. And I suppose if you are going to have a, an, an effect, perhaps the, the more fail-safe system would be to have a slight positive rather than uh, missing things with a, a slight unmarked negative. And again, just for the record, these are the, the different um, troponins, high sensitive troponins, and the troponin I and the troponin T, as we know, that's a single manufacturer. So in conclusion then, I think the key things that come out mostly from Rachel's presentation is that serum indices are in desperate need for some form of harmonization. The hemolysis rate is something that laboratories can have an active role in influencing. You, there will be in vivo hemolysis, which you can't do anything about, but most of the things to do with transport, timing, separation of samples, that is something a laboratory should be, should be having an active role in doing. The serum industry scheme looks at what's going on and it really has fed in a hell of a lot of good information into the, the evidence base to see where we are with these, uh, with these assays. We are continuing to work with the European groups. And the final message is the fact that although off-label, lots of laboratories will be measuring some basic biochemistry in fluids, like, like uh, acidic fluid and pleural fluid. And when, in those situations, these samples do come in a variety of colors. There's green ones, red ones, and brown ones, and things. So you need to make sure you can check this too. 
So the conclusion is, it's a big problem for us and we're getting a good handle on it now. And something like the Uconequus or the HLIL indices helps a long way in this. Thank you. Thank you both for this great presentation. I'd like to now introduce our next speaker, Natalie Mully, Principal Clinical Scientist at the Royal Marston NHS Foundation Trust. Natalie will talk about the electrolyte exclusion effect and the advantages of using direct iron selective electrode based technology and its importance when analyzing samples from cancer patients. Natalie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Eva. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Natalie Mully, and as Eva said, I'm a, a principal clinical biochemist at the Royal Marsden NHS Foundation Trust Hospital. And today I will be talking as part of the Managing Challenging Samples webinar about the electrolyte exclusion effect that is associated with the use of indirect iron selective electrodes, or IFEs. And then I will go on to talk a little bit about the use of direct IFEs and how their use benefits us and our patient population here at the Royal Marsden. So I will just start off by giving a little bit of background about both our hospital and our biochemistry service. So the Royal Marsden is a specialist cancer hospital and we treat over 59,000 NHS and private patients each year. Uh, we cover a range of oncological conditions and we actually have dedicated um, units for all cancer types. Um, in addition to that, uh, the Royal Marsden is also a National Institute for Health Research Biomedical Research Centre for Cancer and we also have close ties with the Institute of Cancer Research. The trust itself uh, currently operates across three locations. There's two main sites. Uh, these are Chelsea in London, and there's another site uh, in Sutton in Surrey. And a few weeks ago, we recently opened up a third site, which is a, a new pri private treatment and diagnostic centre in central London. And across those three sites, we, have, we actually have a dedicated biochemistry laboratory service on each of those three sites. In terms of our equipment that we have across these three sites, we have four Vitros 5600 analyzers. Two of these are located at the Sutton site and two of these over at the Chelsea site. And we do predominantly dry slide chemistry and also immunassay on these analyzers. We also have one Vitros XD3400 and that is a chemistry analyzer and one Vitros ECIQ analyzer and that's at the new lab that we opened a few weeks ago. In terms of our workload, we do around 175,000 um, UNE requests per year. So that would roughly equate to what you would say would be our routine automated biochemistry workload. So compared to larger labs with um, a large GP population and workload, that might not sound like a lot. Um, but one aspect that's fairly unique to our service here at the Marsden in biochemistry is that we have very rapid turnaround time targets. So our published turnaround time targets are 90% within three hours. However, we have two further aspirational turnaround targets. And these are that we aim to get 90% of our routine sample results out within 90 minutes and 60% of our routine sample results out within 60 minutes. So those would be things like our LFTs and UNE tests. And these might sound like quite strict targets, but actually these are targets that we, we do actually meet. We quite often do meet these aspirational targets. In addition to our routine automated lab, we also have a dedicated protein section. And in this section, we do around about 7,000 protein electrophoresis requests per year. And the majority of these patients upon referral to us, uh, they're usually already known or suspected to have a hematological malignancy. And so patients with a condition called multiple myeloma make up quite a large um, proportion of our caseload of work within this section. And because we have a lot of patients with multiple myeloma as part of our workload, uh, many of these patients will have the presence of a paraprotein within their blood. And as a result of this, they will have raised total protein results. And that's important to note because I'm going to come on to talk about this more in the context of electrolyte measurement. So in terms of measuring electrolytes in the laboratory, most high throughput labs will measure sodium and potassium. 
uh, routinely using iron selective electrodes or ISEs. There are two types of ISEs that are commonly used. Um, these are direct ISEs and these use undiluted sample of the electrode surface. And the other type um, of ISEs that are commonly used are indirect ISEs. And these use samples which have been diluted using a suitable buffer prior to analysis. So when we are thinking about sodium, we know that it's the predominant cation in the extracellular fluid. And we know that its main function is involved in the maintenance of fluid and electrolyte homeostasis. Um, the reference range will vary very slightly um, depending on the method you use and the, the patient population that you have, but it's usually around 135 to 145 millimoles per litre. And hyponatremia, which we would define as a sodium of less than 135 millimoles per litre, is the commonly, most commonly seen electrolyte disorder, and particularly within hospital inpatients. And when we are considering the investigation of hyponatremia, or a low sodium, the method of measurement with consideration to direct and indirect ICs is an important factor in the differential diagnosis. The underlying cause of hyponatremia, as you will see from the algorithm that I've put on this slide, is commonly investigated by both assessing the fluid status of the patient and then putting that into context of the plasma and urine sodium measurements and osmolality. Additionally, as part of this investigation, at the top of the tree on the left-hand side, it's important to also initially exclude spurious causes of low sodium. And this occurs due to analytical error secondary to either raised lipids or raised proteins. And that can result in the electrolyte exclusion effect, which I will come on to talk about now. So the electrolyte exclusion effect results in pseudo hyponatremia, aka a falsely low or falsely normal sodium measurement. So essentially it's an underestimate of what the true sodium result would actually be. And the typical pattern would be, we would see in this case, you would have a low measured plasma or serum sodium result, but the osmolality measurement would be what you would say would be normal or, or iso-osmolar, um, and that would be around 275 to 295 milliosms per kilogram. And the electrolyte exclusion effect is an analytical phenomena, and that occurs with electrolyte measurement with indirect ISCs specifically. And the reason this happens is because prior to analysis, the sample undergoes a dilution step. And in doing so, there is an assumption that is made that the plasma is approximately 93% water and the electrolytes are present within that aqueous phase and about 7% solids. So that would be your proteins and your lipids. However, some patient samples actually have increased proteins or lipids. And so because of this, a fraction of that aqueous space is replaced. And so that assumption that the plasma is 93% water actually no longer holds true. And this schematic that I've put up here is used to illustrate how the use of indirect ISEs can result in the electrolyte exclusion effect and therefore pseudo hyponatremia. So there's two tubes here and the sodium concentration in both tubes is actually normal at 140 millimoles per litre. But the tube on the left hand side represents a normal sample with the typical proportions of the solid and plasma water phases. So that would be the 93% aqueous and the 7% non aqueous phases. But on the right hand side, you can see that the tube has a higher percentage of solid phase, as would be seen in hyperlipidemia or hyperproteinemia. When I indirect ICs are are measured before they are measured, they undergo dilution. So in this example, I've, I've put that they've undergone a one in 10 dilution by the automated analyzer. And so what happens is in the right hand side tube, the sodium per litre of total plasma is lower. And so the dilution leads to an underestimate of the sodium that is measured after the dilution step. And so in the example that I put up here, what we actually end up with is a measurement of 112 millimoles per litre. Um, if, you, if you suspect pseudo-hyponatremia or a falsely low sodium result, um, what you can do is you can um, overcome this and you can get a more accurate result by measuring sodium using a direct ISE method. And this can either be a blood gas analyzer 
or alternatively an automated analyzer which uses a direct ISE method. And that's what we use um, at the Royal Master. We use the ortho um, slide. And this um, excludes pseudohyponatremia because there is no dilution step prior to analysis. On this slide, you can see um, a schematic of what the um, direct ISE method looks like by the ortho technology. Each slide contains two ISEs or ion selective electrodes, and these contain an ionophore, which is methylmenensin. And also on this slide, you can see there is a reference layer, a silver layer, and a silver chloride layer, which is coated on a polyester support. And how this works is um, some patient sample and some electrolyte reference fluid are applied to the slide on separate halves and fluid migrates towards the center of that paper bridge that you can see and that forms a stable liquid junction and that connects the reference electrode to the sample electrode and then each of those electrodes will produce an electrochemical potential and that in response to the activity of the sodium and the potential difference between those two electrodes will be proportional to the sodium concentration in the sample. And as there is no dilution of the sample, this method is not prone to pseudohyponatremia, as you would see with indirect ISC method measurements. So use of direct ISC methodology is important in our patient population. As I mentioned earlier, we have a large myeloma caseload. I actually looked um, in our lab uh, system to see how many total proteins um, we requested between March 2019 and March 2020. During that time period, we had approximately 6,000 reported total protein results in that time frame. Around 600 of those were actually above the reference range of 82 grams per litre. So that's around 10% of our samples. And our highest um, total protein result during that time period was actually 139 grams per litre. So you can see we do get very high um, total protein results in our patient population. And I just thought I would use some um, patient results to illustrate um, the electrolyte exclusion effect and pseudohyponatremia. Um, both sets of results on this slide actually belong to the same patient. On the left-hand side, you can see our old method, and we use an indirect ISE measurement for around that time period. And on the right-hand side, you can see where we'll be using the also direct ISE method. So the patient on both of their blood samples had a very similar raised total protein results of around 126 grams per litre. And in both cases, unfortunately, had a very large power protein of greater than 50 grams per litre. However, you can see with the old method that the sodium actually falls below the reference range at 133 millimoles per litre. And on the right, when we transitioned over to also slide direct ISE method, the sodium is actually within the normal range. This would be a typical kind of pattern that you would see. And this, this, this example may represent pseudohyponatremia due to the electrolyte exclusion effect. Another area we have found um, also to be uh, beneficial in the dry slides um, to our patients in terms of improving their clinical care is their ability to be able to provide results even in the presence of hyperlipidemia or raised lipids. Um, as you can, as you would expect, a lot of our patients are actually on chemotherapy medication, and this can't be administered usually until the routine biochemistry, such as the urea and electrolytes and liver function tests, have been seen by pharmacy. And if you look at the, at the results on the left-hand side with our old method, you can see that most of the results have been um, knocked out due to lipemia. The only thing we were able to report was the lipid profile. And if you look on the, the right-hand um, uh, side, you can see um, this patient has a very similar lipid profile. The triglycerides are 9.8 millimoles per litre in both cases. However, with the dry slide method, we were not only able to report out the sodium results and the lipid profile, but actually we were able to report out the full profile of requested tests. And the reason for this is because um, the microside um, technology that's used in the dry slide methods actually acts to filter out um, endogenous sample interference. This is really important because if we can't provide um, results, this could potentially lead to delays in chemotherapy being administered. So just to um, round off really, so why direct ISE and slide methodology in general is beneficial for us. 
So as I've previously alluded to, we have a relatively large proportion of raised total proteins due to the nature of our, our workload. Um, and that could, and these would be patients who would be potentially prone to the electrolyte exclusion effect and pseudohyponatremia due to their very raised total protein results. However, um, we also see uh, reduced effect of lipemia, not just in our electrolyte measurements, but actually all, our, all of our other assays. Um, so you can see on the, the left-hand side, I've put up a table which shows some of the lipemic index thresholds at which results would be knocked out at by the also um, dry slide methods. And you can see most of these are around the 800 um, mark for lipemia index. And to put that number 800 into context, if there was no interference um, from lipids in the sample, this would be less than 20. Um, while we are a small lab compared to um, other centers in terms of numbers of samples that we process each year, as I um, mentioned earlier, we do have very tight turnaround times. The aim for us is to minimize long waits for our patients in having their chemotherapy prescribed. And I think that's even more important in the context of the pandemic and our patient population who might be immunocompromised. Ideally, we don't want them spending more time in the hospital than they need to. And there are several factors that, that I've mentioned that help us to meet our tight turnaround times. But one of the, the things that helps us is the stable IQC performance for our iron selective electrode test, so sodium and potassium. Um, we, our QC is very stable. Um, we are rarely delayed in processing samples because we don't need to spend time troubleshooting failed internal quality control. So once we get our QC on the analyzer and it's, it's out and it's within 2SD, we can just get on and process those samples. We don't see any drift throughout the day, week or month really in our um, IQC performance. And we very rarely need to calibrate. It can actually um, be up to six months um, in between um, calibrations potentially. The main things that would cause us to recalibrate would be if we are changing lot number of slides or if we were changing lot number of electrolyte reference fluid. But otherwise, you know, it can be several months um, between needing to calibrate. So just to conclude, um, the learning points of my talk and the main points. So there are two types of ISEs that are commonly used. These are direct ISEs, which use undiluted sample at the electrode surface and indirect ISEs, and these are samples, these are samples that have been diluted using a suitable buffer. A falsely low or normal sodium result can be obtained due to an analytical phenomenon which can occur when measuring sodium by indirect ISEs. And this occurs due to pathological states of hyperproteinemia or hyperlipidemia, where the assumption that the sample is 93% water no longer holds true. And this is what we call the electrolyte exclusion effect. Pseudohyponatremia due to the electrolyte exclusion effect can be resolved using direct ISE me measurements, such as the ortho method that we use at the Marsden, or by blood gas analysis. Use of these methods allow us to meet our rapid turnaround times, negate the requirement and time taken to exclude pseudohyponatremia, and also improve the reliability of our stadium results. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Natalie. This is really interesting. Last but not least, I would like to introduce Els Mellis, EMEA Senior Marketing Manager for Clinical Labs Assays at Ortho Clinical Diagnostics, who will give us an overview on how vitreous technology can help minimize the impact of interferences. Els, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you, Eva, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, both previous presentations were highlighting the challenge of uh, very common interferences. Now, in the next few minutes, I will give you a brief overview of how the vitreous technologies from Ortho can help minimize the impact of interferences. So, as examples of common interferences, both uh, hemolysis, icterus, and lipemia, as well as electrolyte exclusion effects, were already called out, uh, but there are so much more possible interferences, as you can see here on this slide. Just to name a few, what about impact of water quality or paraprotein interference or risk for carryover? All of these challenges may have an impact on the patient's result, and in some cases, they may even lead to misdiagnosis 
or to further investigations about why results would not match the clinical picture of the patient. If we look at the literature and focus on the incidence of HIL or of paraproteins in specific patient groups, or if we look at the incidence of hypo or hypernatremia in acute care patients or cancer patients, the risk for an erroneous result is real. Actually, uh, based on literature investigation, up to 5% of clinical laboratory test results may potentially be impacted. This, of course, uh, we have to add, is depending on the type of uh, samples that you will get in the laboratory, but the risk is real. However, there is a solution to this. There is good news, of course. Um, to minimize the impact of interferences. What we have at Ortho are six unique Vitros technologies, which are the core of the Vitros analyzers. And in the next few slides, I will give you a few examples of how these help you in delivering high quality results. So let's start with the first one. Um, this example is about microslide technology. And actually we have three formats. And Natalie, he, she just presented already about the second one, about the potentiometric slide, where we use direct uh, ISD technology. However, most chemistry assays are using the first one, the colorimetric principle. So let me talk about that now. With the colorimetric microslide, we actually have multiple layers in which the reaction takes place. And for some assays, we would add even extra layers to trap potential interference. What I want to call out in this slide, on the left side specifically, is the key function of the first layer, which is the spreading layer. This layer does not only uh, evenly spread the few microliters of sample on the slide, but it also captures potential interferences like hemoglobin or lipids. And since we measure reflected light, and the reflection for most assays occurs underneath the spreading layer, the substances are not interfering with the result. So this use of dry chemistry in the slide format is therefore different and more secure compared to wet chemistry systems, which, which you see on the right side, where reflected, refracted, I'm sorry, light passes uh, through the liquids and also through the interfering uh, substances. So in other words, the challenge of HIL is strongly reduced and often completely avoided actually by the use of the spreading layer in the micro slides. And for our homogeneous and heterogeneous immunoassays, we have another technology, Vitros microsensor, which cannot avoid the interference but will measure the potential impact by using the depth volume of the sample and then flag the result if needed. Let's look at another challenge, the potential impact of paraproteins. Many case studies, as you can see some examples listed here, they have been published um, about incorrect results due to paraproteins with wet chemistry. But again here, with the spreading layer, the paraprotein gets captured and does not interfere in the reaction or the reading. Let's look at another challenge, for instance, the impact of bad water quality. Again here, multiple up, uh, publications are available about the potential impact of impurities in the water, which may lead to false results. And with vitros, we do not need external water, just all we need is a plug so no concern about water impurities. And one more example before coming to a close. What about the challenge of bubbles, clots, or carryover? For this, we have the Vitros IntelliCheck technology. And what that does for you is that the aspiration of sample is done through a patented pressure level sensing technology, which would rather report an error when there is a bubble or a clot instead of giving a false result. And finally, thanks to the use of disposable tips, we can also 100% exclude the risk for carryover. So in summary, interferences are a true challenge in the lab, but thanks 
to the built-in safety checks of the vitreous technologies, we can avoid or strongly minimize the potential impact to the patient's results and deliver high-quality assays. With this, I thank you very much for your attention, and I hand it back over to you, Eva. Thank you. Thank you very much, Els. I would like to open up the floor for questions now. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for today. So let's get started. Our first question is for Finlay and Rachel. Indices have no unit as the measurement is rather qualitative rather than quantitative. You use units, which means that you have indices really in quantitative values. How to calculate the indices into quantitative values? Okay, thank you. Um, yes, so we either um, see in the indices as qualitative and they're recorded as a category. Now, I didn't actually show that data in the presentation, but there are a couple of manufacturers that do use categories. So that's like a category of one plus two plus three plus. Or there is a semi-quantitative indices, as what we have shown here. And it's these semi-quantitative indices that are loosely correlated to with, with units and with analytes. So with here, hemolysis, um, that is loosely correlated, correlated to hemoglobin. And the scheme unit that we use is grams per litre, but different manufacturers will have different units. So grams per litre, milligrams per deciliter, and micromoles per litre. And we can use conversion factors to go in bet between those. Uh, with bilirubin and um, icterus, that's loosely correlated with bilirubin. And there's a couple of units in use there, um, micromoles per litre and milligrams per deciliter. And for lipemia, this is loosely correlated to a triglyceride concentration. And the units that we have there are millimoles per litre, grams per litre, or milligrams per deciliter. Now, the interesting thing here is the conversion between millimoles per litre and grams per litre is only a factor of about 1.1, 1.2. I can't remember off the top of my head. So they are very similar. Now, I have got a nice slide, which I haven't got to show you at the minute, that all manufacturers have then their customers reporting results in a mix, not reporting results, but measuring their indices in a mixture of these. And what's really important for you as um, a laboratory user is to know how your instrument has been set up and then your middleware or however, wherever you interpret these units in relation to the test that you're measuring, you have to have the same cutoff values that have been put in. We have known of laboratories that have will be measuring in one unit but applying the hemolysis index from a different unit. So obviously, they, they don't, that doesn't work. You need to be in the same unit. So thank you, Pamela. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. We have another question for Natalie, in fact. Uh, when switching from indirect to direct ISE, percentage-wise, how many more results were you able to report? It's, it's hard to, um, to give a, a firm number on this, but what I would say is, um, we, we practically never um, knock out or don't report um, urea and electrolytes due to interference from um, lipemia with our current method, method because the threshold, um, as I went through in my presentation, is, is very high. So, it's, yeah, it, it doesn't happen um, in practice where we're not able to report um, with our current method. Great. Thank you very much, Natalie. Um, we have time for one more question. This is for uh, Nikwa. Could you provide a brief summary on the outcome of the Kibble project as a whole? Uh, anything the audience should be particularly aware of or, or like a takeaway message? Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, so I do think this is a very good project. We are indebted to everybody that who contributed to this work. And we have a lot of data and we're still processing the raw data. And, but our initial results, our initial review of it shows that on a whole, all manufacturers are affected by indices of hemolysis, icterus, and lipemia to some degree in some of the assays. Now, what we also did, and data I haven't shown here, is we asked laboratories what cutoff they use for a particular assay for their hemolysis, icterus, and lipemia. Now, so I haven't presented this data, but we know from our routine scheme that there is a wide variation. So I think the main cutoff, um, the main take home message from this really is that there are such a wide variation in 
hemolysis enteris and lipemia cutoffs that are being used both with, um, within the different laboratories, different manufacturers. So therefore, this will affect the reporting of patient results in your hospital and the region that you're working in as well. So that is something that I think we, the whole laboratory community needs to take away and look at um, so that there is a better evidence base and a bit better way forward for everybody. Great. Another Thanks thing. for this. Go, go ahead, Finley. So I was just saying one of the, the messages is that the, the material that we made for the project, it, because of the large volumes we were using, because we were dealing with 100 participants with 40 odd analytes at three different levels of, of each of the indices. So in order to make that material, there were, there was a few compromises in there. So although I think we, we did mention in our presentation that we certainly saw the impact of the, of the, the cell content and the color but we didn't, because of the way the specimens were made, we wouldn't show all of the good work that Natalie showed. We didn't have that impact on the on the electrolyte results. We also know that some of the some of the findings that we've seen, we've we have managed to reproduce it with other materials, but it doesn't always exactly fit in what you see in real life. The troponin data that I showed, although we've seen that uh, on other occasions where we've made specimens like this. We think that perhaps the, the vitro system also shows a, a slight negative bias, whereas on, on the data we had, it was slightly positive. So there are little caveats around, around the edges, but by and large, the, the message is, is fairly strong, I think. Great. Thank you very much for the good summary. And that concludes today's session. Before we go, I'd like to thank the speakers and audience for joining us today. Questions we did not have time for and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. Author's purpose is to improve and save lives through diagnostics because every test is a life. For more information about Ortho, please visit our website at orthoclinicaldiagnostics.com. You can also view the webinar on demand and LabWorks will alert you via email when it's available for replay. Stay healthy and safe. And we're looking forward to seeing you at one of our next webinars. Take care. Bye.